Its inception was envisioned as a bank for black people by black people. African Bank is one of the long-standing banks in the country. And in this video, we're going to explore its journey. Welcome to African Bank, the rise and fall and resurgence. How did the establishment of African Bank unfold? African Bank Investments Limited, commonly referred to as ABIL or ABLE, stands as a prominent South African financial institution and serves as the holding company overseeing the operations of African Bank Limited. The genesis of ABLE dates back to a pivotal moment in 1964 during the National African Federal Chamber of Commerce Conference. At this conference, there was a collective resolution to facilitate the creation of a bank with the explicit purpose of unlocking economic opportunities for black South Africans. Taking charge, the NAFCOC board, under the leadership of Sam Mutsunyane, initiated the mobilization of resources essential for establishing a bank by and for the black community. Despite concerted efforts, Motsunyane and the NAFCOP team faced challenges in raising the requisite startup capital within a short time frame. The realization of African Bank came to fruition in 1975 following successful acquisition of government approval by NAFCOC and the raising of the minimum statutory capital amounting to 1 million rand. The inaugural launch took place in Kharangoa, situated on the outskirts of Pretoria, where the bank commenced its commercial banking operations. Notably, the registration and licensing of African Bank coupled with the opening of its first branch during the era of apartheid marked significant milestones for the black community in South Africa. The political landscape of South Africa underwent a profound shift in the early 1990s with the conclusion of apartheid and the subsequent release of Nelson Mandela. In 1994, the country witnessed its inaugural democratic elections, marking the ascent of an ANC government under the leadership of Nelson Mandela. During this period, African Bank continued its modest commercial operations. Regrettably, the democratization process in South Africa took a toll on the bank leading to financial difficulties in 1995, shortly after Nelson Mandela's inauguration. The rescue of African Bank materialized when two prominent investment entities, Natal Building Society and the New African Investments Limited, acquired the controlling stake for 100 million rand. Swiftly, these entities restructured the bank into a dedicated lending institution, listing its stocks on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, JSE. These changes steered African Bank Limited away from the deposit-taking market and resulted in a dilution of its black shareholders. In 1998, Teta Investment Group Limited, or Teta, demonstrated its financial prowess by acquiring African Bank's banking license. Teta subsequently orchestrated a merger involving African Bank, King Finance Corporation, Unity Finance Services, and Alternative Investment Altvin. Founded in 1993, by Leon Kirkenes and Gordon Shashat, Teta had a transformative journey, initially operating as Teta Securities in 1994, joining forces with Hollard Holdings to establish an investment trust and later affiliating with Baobab Growth Limited in 1995. 
Baobab's acquisition of controlling stakes in King, Unity and Altvin in 1997 prompted the renaming of Teta Securities to Teta Investment Group, marking the beginning of its expansion. The culmination of these events led to the birth of African Bank Investments Limited, ABLE, in 1999, succeeding the name change from Teta Investment Group. This adjustment was made in compliance with banking regulations as Teta had ventured into insurance and accumulated loans. ABLE concluded its triumphant expansion and diversification endeavors of the 1990s with the acquisition of Stangen in 1999. Turn of the 21st century, ABLE faced a challenge as the South African government imposed restrictions on the maximum allowable loan-to-income ratios for government employees. According to a report from South Africa's Department of Trade and Industry titled Making Credit Markets Work, a Policy Framework for Consumer Credit, this action was taken to curb irresponsible lending practices that were placing undue financial burdens on government employees. The government aimed to mitigate risks and costs associated with credit by limiting creditors to recovering debts above government-imposed payroll deduction limits directly from borrowers. Consequently, ABLE had to exercise greater discretion when lending to government employees, focusing on minimizing debt costs and the risks of defaults. In response to these challenges, in 2001, ABLE introduced a retail debit product as an alternative transaction platform for its customers. In the early months of 2002, an economic downturn resulted in elevated default rates among borrowers, leading to the collapse of Unifa Holdings Limited and Sambo Holdings Limited. This development was particularly notable as, besides Abel and Capitec Bank Limited, Sambo and Unifa were the only other smaller financial institutions providing personal unsecured loans. However, there was a positive turn for Sambo investors in August 2002 when Abel acquired its personal loans book for 2.8 billion rands. This strategic move not only provided relief for Sambo investors, but also significantly enhanced ABLE's market share, positioning it for long-term profit growth. In 2003, ABLE achieved A1 and A credit rating grades, elevating its credit profile to international standards. This recognition marked a significant milestone for ABLE, underlining its financial stability and credibility in the global financial landscape. The initial vision of ABLE's founders was rooted in the aspiration to establish a Black-owned financial institution that would uplift South Africa's Black community. However, this vision faced challenges after the bank's acquisition by private investors. Fortunately, in February 2005, ABLE revived its commitment to empowering Black South Africans through the introduction of the Aom Shaba program, a 600 million rand 10-year initiative aimed at Black economic empowerment. The program facilitated the discounted sale of ABLE's shares to Black South Africans. Operated as a non-listed independent public entity, Aum Shaba purchased 20 million ABLE shares at a par value of 2 Rand 50 per share shortly after its inauguration in September 2005. Shareholders of Aum Shaba benefited significantly, earning a total of 413 million rand from the transaction based on the market price of 20 rand 50 per share. Notably, the terms of the transaction suspended the trading of Aum Shaba shares 
until January 2011. Amid these initiatives, ABLE broadened its business portfolio by absorbing credit indemnity in 2005 and African Bank Miners Credit in 2006. In 2005, the bank implemented its first phase of price cuts, adopting a price-to-volume elasticity strategy. The introduction of credit cards in 2006 reflected ABLE's response to competitive transformations in the banking industry. A pivotal move occurred in January 2008 when ABLE entered the furniture business through the 9.1 billion rand acquisition of Ellerine's Holdings Limited or EHL. EHL, a retail business specializing in furniture products and home appliances, operated on both credit and cash terms. According to ABLE's 2008 annual report, EHL boasted approximately 1.3 million credit active clients at the time of the acquisition. ABLE was confident that the acquisition of EHL would expand its lending market. As a follow-up to Aom Saba, ABLE also launched the Thumisa Black Equity Ownership Program, reinforcing its commitment to fostering black empowerment. ABLE maintained its prosperity in the early 2010s, a period when numerous businesses were still recovering from the impacts of the 2008-2009 global economic crisis. By 2010, the credit card value of the bank had reached 3 billion rand. The integration of Ellerin's Holdings Limited Financial Services was successfully completed in 2010 and in 2011, ABLE took a significant step by introducing banking kiosks in EHL stores. The year 2011 marked another historic achievement for the company with the successful launch of its Euro Medium Term Note or EMTN program at the London Stock Exchange LSE. Company records indicate that the bank raised $300 million from the listing of the bond at the LSE. In 2012, ABLE expanded its EMTN program to Switzerland, listing 150 million Swiss franc or 1.26 billion rand at the 6 Swiss exchange. The company offered a coupon rate of 4.75% annually with a duration scheduled to last until July 2015 as outlined in a press statement. Concurrently, ABLE's value of loan advances experienced substantial growth, reaching 53 billion rand by the end of 2012. By the end of 2013, ABLE had amassed 59 billion rand in unsecured loan advances, but this achievement was overshadowed by the challenges the bank faced particularly concerning high rates of loan defaults. In August 2013, a Reuters article by Helen Nyambura Mwaura highlighted a 26% drop in the bank's first half profit, accompanied by a write-off of 445 million rand in bad loans, raising concerns about its financial stability. Further signs of the financial strain emerged in August 2013 when ABLE hinted at plans to sell EHL, a furniture selling unit that had yet to yield profits five years post-acquisition. The planned sale was seen as a positive step considering that EHL's debt write-downs and impairments were impacting the bank's profits. Simultaneously, ABLE announced plans to raise additional equity capital through a rights issue before the end of 2013. In 2013, the bank posted a 4.2 billion rand annual loss as reported by Rene Bonacris 
in an article for Bloomberg on November 13, 2013, confirming Abel's deteriorating financial situation. In December 2013, Abel announced the successful completion of a rights offer that bolstered its capital. This rights offer, initially announced in August 2013, raised 5.5 billion rand from the sale of more than 685 million ordinary shares, underwritten by Goldman Sachs International in collaboration with the International Financial Corporation. On August 6, 2014, Abel sent shockwaves through South African markets when it issued a warning of impending record full year losses. In a Bloomberg article on August 7, 2014, Bonacus reported that Abel had lost about 90% of its market value after forecasting a record loss and saying it needs to tap investors for $791 million of fresh capital. Bonacris highlighted that in addition to seeking an 8.5 billion rand capital injection, the bank anticipated its losses to escalate to 7.6 billion by the end of 2014. This bleak forecast, coupled with the resignation of Leon Kirkinus, Abel's co-founder and long-serving CEO, led to a substantial decline in the bank's shares to their lowest ever levels. Abel's troubles deepened due to escalating levels of bad debts, stemming from imprudent lending practices. According to Bonacris's August 7, 2014 Bloomberg article, the South African National Credit Regulator, NCR, had raised concerns over Abel's reckless lending in March 2013, prompting the bank to shelve a planned $300 million international bond issue. The bank's precarious situation was further exacerbated by its 2008 acquisition of EHL. Although the acquisition of the furniture retailing arm aimed to diversify Abel's lending markets, the pre-acquisition liabilities and post-acquisition loss-making streak left the bank burdened with unprecedented financial challenges. The South African Reserve Bank, Saab, took decisive action, placing Abel under administration a bankruptcy state referred to as curatorship in South Africa on August 10, 2014. Saab appointed Tim or sorry Tom Winterbrew from PricewaterhouseCoopers as the principal curator with immediate effect, unveiling recapitalization measures to prevent Abel from sliding into further financial turmoil. One key rescue measure involved the division of Abel into two components, a good bank and a bad bank. According to an article published on the Fin24 website on August 20, 2014, the good bank was to receive a 10 billion rand capital injection to strengthen its book value, totaling 26 billion rand net of portfolio-related impairments. Saab indicated that a consortium of investors would underwrite the bank's 10 billion rand recapitalization fund. The article also confirmed that the bad bank was slated to absorb Abel's distressed loans amounting to 17 billion rand, with Saab committing to assume 7 billion rand of the distressed assets. However, Saab clarified that the creation of the bank did not equate to debt forgiveness for loan defaulters. Subsequently, Abel's shares were suspended from the JSC and international stock markets due to the curatorship. On August 17, 2014, South Africans were taken aback when Tami Sokudu, Abel's former chief risk officer, attributed the bank's collapse to imprudent lending of unsecured loans to financially vulnerable borrowers incapable of servicing such debts. This declaration was particularly surprising given Sokudu's responsibility for risk management during his tenure at the bank. 
an article by Tekiso Anthony Lefifi published on the Times Live website on August 17, 2014, conveyed Sokutu's unapologetic stance, quoting him as proudly stating that he lived lavishly with no regrets and suggesting that borrowers should not have applied for loans if they were aware they could not repay them. Abel promptly disassociated itself from Sokutu's comments, highlighting that he had resigned from the bank in February 2014. A press statement released on the Abel website on August 17, 2014, reassured the bank's customers of its ongoing commitment and loyalty. The statement affirmed that the bank's placement into curatorship would not disrupt the provision of banking services, emphasizing that all branches and call centers remained operational. The revitalized African bank emerged from a 20-month hiatus and was officially relaunched on April 4, 2016. During its dormant period, the South African Reserve Bank played a pivotal role by investing 3 billion rand and a consortium of banks rallied to support the bank during its time of need. Since then, African Bank has experienced a commendable resurgence in performance. In 2018, the bank's retail deposits reached an impressive 1.1 billion rand, witnessing a substantial growth of 115% to 2.4 billion rand in 2019. This funding base accounted for 12% of its total funding liabilities. Notably, the bank reported a net profit of 534 million rand for the fiscal year ending on September 30, 2021. In a strategic move to accelerate its entry into the South African business banking sector, African Bank acquired Grindrod Bank in May 2022 for 1.5 billion rand. Additionally, the revived African Bank announced the acquisition of U-Bank's assets and liabilities, taking on its employees on an ongoing basis for 80 million rand in the same year. The bank reported a net profit of 736 million rand for the financial year ending 2022. Under the leadership of CEO Kennedy Pungane, who assumed the position in April 2021, succeeding Basani Maluleke, the former head of Barclays Africa, African Bank is poised for further growth. Plans are in place to list the bank by 2025, providing an opportunity for the Reserve Bank and other stakeholders to exit their shareholdings acquired during its rescue. This anticipated listing marks the final resurrection of what was once South Africa's largest unsecured lender, underscoring the remarkable turnaround after its near demise that could have had profound implications for the country's financial system. Thank you for your attention, and if you found this information valuable, please consider giving the video a thumbs up. Until next time, goodbye.